So firstly, thank you for inviting me to this edition of the uh, fora. Um, I'm really honored to be given this opportunity to share with you the work that I'm doing around mental, neurological, and substance use disorder research, uh, advocacy, and capacity building. Um, I thought I'd share three lessons, really, that touch on leadership, um, but I guess on strategy as well, really based more on my own personal experience in the past 10 years. Um, a few weeks ago, I was in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, attending the annual scientific meeting of the African Mental Health Research Initiative, of which I am the director. And while I was there, during one of the coffee breaks, I was sitting with two of the PhD students from Ethiopia while we were waiting for the rest of the team to join us for, um, for a coffee ceremony. These are a big deal in Ethiopia. So while we were waiting for the rest of the team to join us, one of the PhD students, uh, Mektes, asked me a question. And she's like, so Dixon, what three lessons based on your personal experience from a work context would you encourage PhD and postdoc students to follow as future research leaders in Africa. And I thought about the things that had influenced the work that I'm doing today. And the three lessons are essentially what I will be talking to you about, pretty much from a very personal uh, experience. But I hope you will be able to resonate with um, what I will be sharing with you. And, and the first lesson is really about maintaining an emic perspective in the work that you do in Africa. And that is being able to immerse yourself in the culture, understanding the importance of culture, and being able to link that ethic perspective with the emic perspective. I'll get back to that in a, in, in a short while. The other thing is amplifying your work, taking your work to the next level. And the last one is telling your story. Researchers in Africa, academics in Africa, are not telling their stories. Yes, we are publishing in scientific journals, we are attending scientific conferences, but we are not telling our stories. Telling your story is a lot more than just publishing in a high-impact journal. So anyway, um, between 2003 and 2005, I was working as a junior consultant for the World Health Organization, focusing on, um, on, on policy and uh, human rights uh, in Africa. So my, my job, essentially, as a junior consultant was to travel across Africa with the senior WHO consultants and sit down with policymakers and try and formulate policies, legislations that protect the rights of people with mental illness across Africa. Because in Africa, this is not unusual. In fact, in a lot of low and middle income countries, you know, the abuse of the rights of people living with uh, mental illnesses is quite uh, pervasive. And it was during one of these visits um, in a place called Wida in Benin that I picked up my first lesson. This is a picture of the famous door of no return. Some of you may be familiar with this if you've been to, to Wida. It symbolizes the path that slaves 
had to take as they were forced onto ships that, uh, that then took them to the Americas. So Wida is a small little place that is rich in tradition and culture and a lot of conspicuous memories about, about the slave trade. Another fascinating thing about Wida, the fruits, particularly the pineapples, they are just delicious, you know. The lesson has nothing to do with pineapples, by the way. I just thought I'd mention that. Um, the lesson has more to do with, with the religion or the culture of, of voodoo. When I got to Wida, I didn't know that this was the capital city of voodoo. You know, I was there staying in this WHO compound where we were doing our work, and every evening outside in the village you heard the music, these, these ceremonies, you know, every single day. And coming from the south, southern part of Africa, my perception of voodoo was that this was something to be avoided. You know, so naturally I stayed away. But with time, out of interest, you know, I thought, let's try and find out, you know. And I mean, after all, you know, um, these voodoo ceremonies, they seemed a lot more enticing than, than a coffee ceremony, isn't it? And so, and so gradually, starting off from a distance, observing, I got to get more involved, observing what was happening. Eventually, I ended up actually getting into the, the temple, the voodoo priestess temple. But what was revealing about my time in, in Wida at the time was that there was such a disconnect between what I was doing as a consultant for the World Health Organization. Here we were trying to formulate these policies aimed at changing the landscape in Africa so we can address mental health issues, human rights issues, and right outside we had these voodoo priests who were so influential. And the majority of people who were being brought to the voodoo priests were actually people living with mental illness. I distinctly remember sitting in there and, you know, being a psychiatrist, I could obviously diagnose what was happening. You know, it was like an encyclopedia of, of psychiatry. You have people who are talking to themselves, you know, actively hallucinating, uh, a young woman who just had a baby who had what looked like a puperal psychosis, you know, uh, a young man who'd had uh, generalized tonic-clonic seizures, you know, uh, with, with facial injuries. Um, and what was really revealing about all of this was the way, the way that these priests communicated with, uh, with the clients, you know, the use of this rich uh, indigenous idioms of distress, you know, it was just, it was just mind blowing, you know, and, and the way they, they related to each other. And so, this was my first big lesson in terms of the need as scientists, researchers, to truly immerse ourselves in the culture. If we don't do that, how can we truly understand what people are experiencing? That emic component uh, became such, a, such an important feature in my perception of what I was to do as a psychiatrist. So there you go, that was the first lesson that I picked up, and I, I didn't know how I was going to use it. You know, and you know, you pick up these lessons in life sometimes and you have no clue how you're going to use them, but you realize that this is quite important. I went back to Zimbabwe and um, in 2005, uh, a major political upheaval occurred. I mean, Zimbabwe is constantly having major political upheavals. 
But in 2005, on the 25th of July, the government of Zimbabwe randomly woke up one morning and decided to carry out this operation, which was called Operation Murambatsuina, which literally means removing the dirt. The objective was to use the uniformed forces across the country to demolish every single building that the government, quote unquote, deemed illegal, but it was actually a politically motivated move. In a very short space of time, over 700,000 people were left homeless and over 2 million people were traumatized psychologically. It only stopped after the then United Nations Secretary General Kofi Annan sent uh, Tibaijuka to intervene, but it was a bit too late. And anyway, it stopped, and in 2005, thousands and thousands of Zimbabweans left um, for the United Kingdom, for South Africa. And at the time, I was the only psychiatrist working within the public health space, and I was tasked to do something with no money. And picking up from the lessons that I had acquired in Wida from the voodoo priests, surprisingly, we turned to grandmothers to sort out this problem and came up with the program, which is currently still running, called the Friendship Bench. I mean, there were lots of other factors that came into play for Friendship Bench to be formed. We tapped into grandmothers because they are, in African culture, the custodians you know, of local culture and wisdom. And at the time, these grandmothers were truly rooted in their communities. Young people had left. Uh, the nurses were not interested in addressing mental health issues. They were just too busy doing a lot of other things, and rightly so, you know, focusing on HIV, maternal and child health. You know, anyway, to cut a long story short, we developed this intervention, which was truly rooted in, in an emic perspective, which was designed to use indigenous concepts and terms to address psychological morbidity, in particular common mental uh, disorders. You know, the surprising thing is we use the DSM-5 or the Diagnostic Statistical Manual or the ICD-10 in psychiatry, but a lot of what is written in DSM-5 does not truly apply to African populations. You know, for instance, the word depression does not exist in any African language. You know, um, when you look at some of the um, the manifestations or the idioms of distress that um, you know, reflect um, psychological psychopathology in Africa. You know, um, for instance, you know, the, the somatization, the, the, the anger, the crying, none of those things are captured in DSM-5. And so, and so we came up with this model, you know, at the time, the objective was not to carry out research. You know, it was never to carry out research. The, the, the objective was really to respond to a crisis. And um, eventually, we packaged that, and uh, it, we tested it through, uh, through a cluster randomized control trial, which showed that these grandmothers were extremely effective in, uh, in treating what we call in the West depression and what we call, in my part of the world, kufungi sisa, which literally means thinking too much. And uh, the cluster randomized control trial showed that after, four, after six months of follow-up, people who had received therapy from these grandmothers were essentially doing much better than those who had received therapy from, from psychologists, trained uh, nurses, and also these, these grandmothers produced better results than, um, than, than, than Prozac, you know. So, 
So we eventually decided to, to take this to scale, which essentially is what has happened over the past couple of years. Uh, and when you ask these grandmothers what it is that they do, in essence, they will say, you know, we, we create space for community healing. You know, so in essence, what they're doing is they are creating space, bringing in that emic uh, perspective and experience, you know, that rich culture, the use of appropriate, um, you know, terms, um, which really truly reflect um, experiences that people are going through and injecting into that an ethic perspective, which is really a cognitive behavioral therapy-based approach to provide a structured uh, therapy on a park bench in the communities. And um, so we have hundreds of these park benches in different communities across the country, and all of them are run by grandmothers. And people come to these grandmothers for, for, um, for treatment. You know, so we've truly managed to elevate, to elevate um, the role of grandmothers in, uh, in our society. And it's something that um, I think we don't look at much in Africa. And in fact, this is the rest of the world, actually. You know, our older population they inherently have wisdom. I mean, if somebody's lived up to 80, 85, and they are cognitively still intact, you know, the wealth of wisdom that they, they possess just based on their experience, based on their lived experiences alone is just, is just phenomenal. But anyway, you know, we've taken this package, um, you know, to different parts of, um, of the world and using the very same model uh, and linking up with grandmothers, you know, we've introduced it uh, in Zanzibar. And, um, and, and, and surprisingly, the same model works, is working in New York City. If there's time, I'll show you a little, a little clip that is being used by the New York uh, City Health Department uh, to promote friendship benches, something which was started by grandmothers in Africa. You know, it's also working in, in New York City. Um, so that's, that really touches on my first lesson, which is, you know, holding on to an emic perspective in all you do, uh, whether you're working in the laboratory, whether you're working as an anthropologist, which is kind of pretty obvious for anthropologists because they do these things anyway. But for other people, you know, who are not working in that field, it, it, you know, sometimes people might think, well, how, how can I possibly... There are lots of ways of doing it. Um, you know, we often, as African academics and science scientists, we, we often are unable to articulate what we do in our own languages, which is sad. Um, I often say to my PhD students, this is great work. Would you be able to go to your village and actually share this with people in your village. And most of the time they can't. So what is the relevance of the research that we're doing? Who are we doing it for? So we need to really take all this knowledge that we have here in Oxford and start thinking about how we can translate this knowledge so that the ordinary folks in our village in Africa can appreciate it. How do we need to translate the work we're doing so that it's not just for scientists, but it's also for my grandmother? Move on to the next, next, um, next lesson, which is all about amplifying your work. You know, um, so amplification, again, this is based on my own, you know, lessons, you know, what I've picked up over the years, it's something which is, it has to be deliberate. You have to think about amplification the minute you start doing your PhD. It shouldn't happen when you're finished. And amplification essentially is 
how are you going to take your work to the next level so that it eventually has impact? And, um, and when I realized that the friendship bench was really working, my immediate objective was to make sure that with time, the Friendship Bench is declared a national mental health program, at least in Zimbabwe, which has happened. It's taken a while, um, but it, it has happened. And again, it's all about what tools do you use to get you to that end point and one tool that I've found extremely effective, at least in the work that I do in mental health, is theory, theory of change workshops, where you bring on board um, key stakeholders, not just the politicians, but people at grassroots, the grandmothers, the work that I get credit for on the friendship bench is truly, to be honest, work that is carried out by the grandmothers. The ideas that I speak to you about here are ideas that have come from the grandmothers through these, these workshops. When you can lower the level of your workshop so that they are truly inclusive and anyone at community level, regardless of their level of education, can participate and feel that they have contributed, then you're on the right track to, to, um, to amplification. The theory, of, the theory of change map is such a powerful thing. If the most, if the lowest person in that group academically can look at it and actually say, this is where we're going. These are the indicators. These are the barriers. These are the assumptions we're making. Now imagine if a grandmother in a community looks at a theory of map and is able to articulate all of that. Then you have buy-in. So if you have your grandmothers, you have your, you know, your policy makers, and they can all see and share the same vision, then you're on your way. And, and, so, and, 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 this, uh, and this is what I have consistently done as my second lesson to try and amplify things, every, every piece of work that I do um, when we've taken you know, the friendship bench um, to Malawi, Zanzibar, New York City, we always use the theory of change. And when we were in the Bronx in New York City, we were like, nope, yes, New York um, City Health Department is cool, but you know, we want to interact with folks who live in the Bronx. Let's hear what stories they have to say. You know, let's hear what language they want to use. You know, um, and and that's in essence. And the surprising thing is, the challenges that we face in Africa, you know, are not very different from those that people in the Bronx, in New York City, face. You know, the, the, the world has truly become a global village in terms of the challenges that we're all facing. Um, and so, um, so using that model, again, we, we've managed to, to really scale up the Friendship Bench and uh, hopefully we are you know, contributing to, to uh, building capacity around um, how programs of this nature can be scaled up you know, because um, scaling up a program is a completely different ball game altogether. You know, it's, um, it, it requires uh, a different approach. So that's one aspect of amplification. The next aspect of amplification it involves my work with, um, with, um, with African Mental Health Research Initiative, you know, um, as Kevin mentioned. And this, this to me has been an amazing opportunity of um, really focusing on capacity building, you know, making sure that we are building the next generation of African research leaders, you know, who are carrying out relevant research uh, on the continent and are contributing not just on the continent, but can contribute globally, you know, and, and this is what I, I, I always say to my, to my, to my, to my PhD postdoc, uh, students, 
you have to aim to contribute globally. If you aim to contribute just locally, uh, you're missing the point. The world has truly become a global, a global village. I'll move on to my last, my last um, lesson, which is really the importance of telling your story. And I didn't know that this was important. You know, when I started publishing, I was like, you know, I mean, as long as I get my, my work in, in a high impact journal, that's it, man. If I can go to a, to, to a conference, a scientific conference and present my work, that's it. But actually there's a lot more to it than that. You know, there's really a lot more to it than that. And I was fortunate a, a few years ago um, to be, um, part of the Aspen New Voices Fellowship. And that's where I really learned a lot about the importance of, of telling your story. This is a picture of two of my colleagues from the Aspen uh, New Voices uh, Fellowship. That's, um, that's, that's the Aspen Mountain in the background there. It's cool, isn't it? <laughs> so that is, that is Moses Ariong from, from, from Uganda and Asia Adebe, Adebe from, uh, from Mali. Both of them very vocal, you know, about what Africa needs to, to, um, to do to move forward. Uh, and, and Moses, uh, Moses was very um, expressive. And I remember one, the first time we met as Aspen New Voices Fellows, you know, in Johannesburg. And these are people from all over the world, actually, who are brought in by Aspen. Um, uh, so Aspen, you know, they, I don't know what criteria they use, but if they think you have a story to tell, they will somehow find you. Uh, so, so, uh, so Moses was saying, you know, during one of our meetings, Moses is like, you know, I'm, I'm always fascinated at how, you know, you have these young American researchers, they come to our HIV clinic, you know, and they spend a few months there they go back to America, and suddenly he's an expert in HIV. And, and me, I've been doing this for 15 years. I still don't feel like I'm an expert. You know, and so the entire debate evolved around that. What is an expert? At what point do you actually call yourself an expert? You know, and, and what are the ingredients of, of an expert? You know, it was quite a stimulating debate you know, with, um, with all the fellows and, and, uh, and the facilitator there. And, and the final conclusion really was that if you don't have a story to tell, how can you be an expert? You know, there are people who publish tons and tons of papers, but they have no story to tell. It's, it's something that I've never thought of, actually. But anyway, that's, that's, that was the bottom line. You have to tell your story through the work that you do. Because human beings identify with stories, not with p-values and confidence intervals. <laughs> you know, and, and, and so I, that's one of the things that I have done systematically since then. You know, I, uh, I make it a habit, you know, every other month to get an op-ed uh, published in, in, um, through, through the media. And um, this, this is an example of something that was recently published about the work that we're doing. And th these op-eds, you write on your own, but you also actively look for people to tell your story. And you'd be surprised how many people are interested in telling the African story. And you need to share that story, not only with people in Africa. So it's important when you're writing an op-ed to go for the highest possible um, you know, media outlet that is out there. If they reject you, go to the next one. You'll always find some. If you've, if you, if you've published and you've, been, you've, you've experienced the horror of rejection you know, in, in, you know, in scientific journals, this is nothing. Yeah. This is truly nothing, and it, but it's, it's very important. So this, this is something that we published um, on the 30th of April, not so long ago. And, and what, I, what I also try to do is make sure that the publications are not just in English, um, 
Um, one of our most recent one is, is, um, is, is, is in Le Monde, uh, a French, French newspaper. So op-eds are important, but the other, the other important thing, you know, and, and, and by the way, these op-eds are usually a thousand words, you know, so it's not like writing a manuscript. You know, you can write an op-ed in two, three days, uh, and it will give you impact. And why are these, why are these op-eds important is if you're a researcher, most of us rely on uh, research funding from, you know, your traditional donors. You know, when you write op-eds, you increase the chances of getting unrestricted funding. Because there are a lot of people out there who will simply write to you and say, I like your story. I want to help. You know, and, and as researchers, thinking about having restricted, unrestricted funding is critical especially if you work in Africa, there are so many things that happen. When you have a research grant with fixed budget lines, when there's a crisis, you need a pot of money that you can fall back onto. And these unrestricted fundings are critical for those kind of things. You know, I mean, our funders don't often understand, you know, that Things change, you know, you write a grant, but when you're on, in the field, things change, you know. Um, so so this, is, this is important. So the other aspect of, um, of um, telling your story is, is um, presenting yourself in a non-scientific uh, environment, you know, platform. And again, through the Aspen New Voices, I've been, I've been really privileged uh, to present at different forums, you know, and um, and and um, a few years ago I was at the at the TED uh, uh, forum in uh, in New Orleans with this amazing person, Minda Dentler, who is also an Aspen New Voices fellow. Minda, born in India, developed polio, abandoned by her biological parents goes on to become this great advocate for the complete eradication of polio, the only woman in the world to complete the world Ironman race. Um, very powerful story, uh, amazing person who's doing great stuff, not only for herself, but, but for the world. But what is really, really, um, fascinating about her is that she has a powerful story that goes with the work that she does. So when we were in New Orleans, when we were in New Orleans, you know, after we, I gave my TED talk and Minda did hers as well, we, so I decided, you know, based on my first lesson, you know, to, to go out there and immerse myself in the local culture, you know, and, uh, New Orleans, New Orleans is, is just an amazing place when you think of the culture, the music. Uh, it's just amazing. But anyway, so I'm, 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 I'm in, in New Orleans in this French Quarter um, walking, and you won't believe what I see right there in front of me as I'm walking. I see the House of Voodoo in New Orleans. And this is not a joke. This is for real, hey? And I'm, you know, suddenly deja vu, you know, deja vu, and, and, I, and I'm like, let's go in there and find out what's happening. So I, I get in there, and it's like a voodoo temple with all the paraphernalia hanging from the ceiling, from the walls, but it seems a bit empty. And then in the corner, there's this woman, a white woman, sitting there, and I'm, I look at her, and I'm like, what's the deal? And she says, I'm the voodoo priestess. Okay. And um, how, how did you become a voodoo priestess? And she's like, well, I was in Haiti, where I spent over 15 years doing this work, and, um, and I've spent some time in, in Wida, 
And I'm like, wow, really? Didn't know what to say when she mentioned Wida, and I'm like, so did you, did you, did you try the pineapples in Wida? <laughs> And she, she, she looked at me and smiled, and she said, you've been there too, haven't you? And, and then she said, uh, and then she said um, you know, we have a, a voodoo ceremony. You're in about 30 minutes' time. Would you, would you like to join us? You know, but she, you know, she, and I, I was expecting the same kind of things from, from Wida, but she said, no, we, 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 will, be, we will be praying for, for world peace. You know, that's, a, that's an unusual focus in, in, in voodoo. Um, and so I, I obliged and, and I joined her uh, 30 minutes later. So I think um, that's just a little, little ending to the whole story. I don't know if we have time for... Um, so, so since we have time, I'd like to show you a little video. I'm not sure how we do this. This is... This is um, a video that the New York Health, uh, the New York City Health Department is using to promote friendship benches. It just highlights, um, it's very short, it's like three minutes. Friendship Benches is a new innovative program based on organic communication and just asking people how they are and meaning it when you ask them how they're doing. Friendship benches should be all over the world. <laughs> it's so huge that they are sitting at these benches in the heat for the chance that maybe somebody will walk by that would need some help. They'll be able to sit there and connect them to care. We've had some amazing peers on our team, you know, Steven Lopez, who lives his recovery daily, has in fact walked over 10 people to medical detox just from giving his story and being committed to the change that he can be in the community. I can see a mirror. I can see myself on the other side. I can see what, they, what they're going through, I went through. Skip has lived a very complex and challenging life and now she's this hero to so many. She leads our peer work as the peer supervisor. Every conversation makes a difference because people are heard. It's like, yeah, you know, you know, you've been there, you can help. Those person to person, those peer to peer uh, relationships and feeling comfortable in one's surroundings really do make a difference. Friendship Benches was designed and started in Zimbabwe by Dr. Dixon Chibanda. And in the last year alone, more than 30,000 people received treatment on the Friendship Bench in Zimbabwe. Dr. Mary Bassett, who was the New York City Commissioner of Health, having worked in Zimbabwe for 17 years, was just like, how about we think about ways to bring this model to New York City so that the everyday New Yorker could engage with someone and get support around mental health. So we innovated. New York City is unique because it's so active that the streets are where people like to be. That's why Friendship Benches in New York is so real. When you're walking down the street and you're stressed out and you're struggling with something, and you're thinking about how you could get support and then out pops Skip and she's like, hey, how you doing? Our peers can sit there and call and connect a New Yorker to resources and get them an appointment. It's a magical moment that our peers wait for every single day. Every month, hundreds of people are saying thank you. This is the power of Friendship Benches. This is the power of that magical moment, and we get to be a part of it. Thank you. I'm done. So I'm sure, thanks so much, Dixon. I'm sure everyone can see why we were so keen and so pleased when Dixon agreed to come and 
uh, opened the, the fora. Just a fantastic story. Um, so we <laughs> so uh, happy to take questions and comments and discussions on what Dixon has said. So, uh, do we have a mic, um, Avni? Uh, uh, we'll bring you the roving mic now. So there's a question here at the front. Just wait for the mic so that it's on the um, recording. Uh, no, it's just a matter of getting it onto the recording, if possible. I, have we got the mic at the... So I, I should say to people, as you will have noticed, we are filming and recording. If anybody feels that they don't want to, to be, please let us know and we'll make sure that that's obliterated from the record, if anyone feels for any reason that that's the case. Um, do we have one or...? Why don't you speak into my mic? So uh, firstly, um, it's incredible work that you're doing. Um, it's really great to see. Um, do you have any plans of bringing this model to the UK at any point? Because um, I, I, be, I believe depression is a major thing that affects this country as well. So uh, just out of curiosity, is, is it something that you plan on doing? Yeah, thank you for that question. Yeah, we actually have been looking into that because I'm um, I'm attached to the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, and so through, through the Center for Global Mental Health, we are looking into how best to bring Friendship Bench uh, to the United Kingdom in, uh, in general. Um, as you know, in, you know the, the United Kingdom is one of the only countries, I guess, in the, in, in the whole world that has uh, a program that is wholly funded by the government, you know, the IAPT, the Improving Access to Psychological Therapies. It's not a perfect program, but I think the British government has done extremely well in actually putting money into it. You know, uh, IAPT is reaching out to more than 500,000 people every year. It's obviously not enough. Uh, and so we're looking at ways of how best we can support IAPT um, with uh, e innovations like the Friendship Bench, yeah. Yes, one there. I think we do now have a microphone, so we're going to see if it works. Hello. Oh, great. Thank you so much for the presentation. Uh, you, you shared a bit about the importance of adaptation across contexts. I also noticed that you have a youth friendship bench, and I'm curious how you thought about adapting kind of the model to the youth focus, uh, given the role of the grandmother and how, how that process uh, happened. Actually, I'm being a hopeless chair. Could I ask people to just introduce themselves when they, so that we know who's asking the questions? So. Sure. Uh, Noam Ingrest. I'm a DPhil student here, and right. I also run an organization called Young Love that's really interested in Friendship Bench right. and exploring that. Thank you. So thank you. Yeah, so we do have... Uh, so one of the things that has happened since, um, you know, the original Friendship Bench started, which is what I presented, you know, through the interactions with the grandmothers, we are constantly learning and figuring out how best to strengthen it. And so the Youth Friendship Bench is just one aspect of how to strengthen and increase uptake of young people to the bench. Um, you know, the, the interesting thing though is that, you know, our hypothesis was these young educated university students will do a better job than the grandmothers. They're not, you know. So we actually are finding that they seem to do better when they are linked with a grandmother. You know, so, um, but they, they still have a role to play. Um, the, other, the other thing that people always ask me is, why not grandfathers? You know, we, 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 had, we had tried grandfathers, you know, um, but you know, the Friendship Bench is all about creating space um, and giving people space to share their lived experiences. And what we've consistently found about grandfathers is that they, they actually don't give you space. They tell you what you need to do, you know? Um, whereas the Friendship Bench is really all about helping you to figure out your own story and your own solution, you know? So again, we're trying to figure out how best to use grandfathers, probably not on the bench, you know, but maybe, you know, doing other things. Great, Vicky. Working, it doesn't. Oh, there we go. 
Um, so Vicky Marsh, so um, I'm based in the Kemri Wellcome Trust Research Programme in Kenya as well as in uh, Centre for Tropical Medicine in Oxford um, and working within the MSC for International Health and Tropical Medicine. Um, so my question was a bit about, I, I think you might have begun to allude to it really in thinking about the difference between grandmothers and grandfathers, which was, and it's also something to do with how you bring the emic and the etic together and it's around what happens when grandmothers have quite strong values for example have some quite strong values for example that might not be entirely appropriate to the person who's coming to them so i don't know if that's to do with the training or how you deal with that i'm just thinking of a small example which is in kenya there's a fabulous now ngo that was set up to empower girls through football um, and when it was first set up, there was huge resistance to the idea that girls should play mm. football, that it might, they would become infertile or, you know, whatever. Um, so, you know, there were some really kind of big cultural and value-based um, issues to overcome there, which were quite structural within the society. So I was just wondering, when you turn to grandmothers and get them to kind of counsel and listen, do you ever come across any of those sorts of clashes of value and how do you deal with it? So, thank you very much, that's important. So I didn't talk about the actual training that the grandmothers go through, you know. So we do have core competencies that we look for. Um, so in terms of um, education, all we need the grandmothers to be able to do is read and write and use a mobile phone. And then we also look at soft skills, you know, um, their ability to, to provide space is a big one. So when we train them, often we audio record, we video record, and from that we can tell which grandmothers are suitable for the bench work because there are different levels. There's the bench work, and then we have grandmothers who go into the community to follow up on those who have been seen on the bench. So it's not all the grandmothers who do the same thing. They do different things based on their strengths. And obviously on the bench, we look for grandmothers who are very open-minded. You know, um, That's how we do away with that. But obviously we will have cases as Frenchy Bench grows. I mean, right now we have over 500 people who are who are delivering this, naturally we will have issues like that. And one of the things that we do is we audio record sessions. And so when we listen to the sessions, when we go through them, we can tell who's kind of going off and we sit down with them if, if, if necessary. Just, just think. Uh, thank you very much for the wonderful talk. Uh, I'm Naseji Justin, originally from Uganda and an early career biostatistician based in South Africa. Uh, I, I'm just curious uh, to know how the benches have changed the attitude around depression uh, within the communities uh, you are working with. Because uh, in, in the African context, there's always that divide between the rural and, uh, uh, and the urban population. So have you done any study to basically see how people's attitudes have changed towards the depression in, 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 all, in both communities? Yes, um, so I, I didn't share much um, about the publications that are linked to the Friendship Bench. We, there are over 50 peer-reviewed publications that are linked to the Friendship Bench. I, I only shared, I think, two publications, um, but with come, coming to your question, um, I think what makes the friendship bench acceptable to communities is because we've moved away from the use of terms that are often associated with stigma. You know, just the name itself, friendship bench, does not sound medical at all. When we first started, you know, it was called the mental health bench and no one came, you know, and, uh, and the grandmothers actually had to sit down with me and say, you know, um, you need to change the name. When we changed the name, people came, and again, the language that is used, you know, to navigate through the different sessions or components of the intervention uh, are very 
local and um, they resonate with local communities. For instance, just briefly, quickly, the three components of the intervention, they are called kuvrap um, which literally means opening up the mind, and kusimudzira, which means to, to uplift, and kusimbisa, which means to strengthen. None of those sound medical at all, but we have deliberately rooted them in CBT principles and structures. So, Jody and then Alan, and then I'm trying to keep track. There's quite a lot of hands, so I'll try and keep track. Um. Thank, thank you so much, sir, for um, the presentation. My question is, I would want you to actually elaborate on your personal experience that led to um, the establishment of Friendship Bench. And the second question is, are there any form of um, trainings or any form of um, trainings in particular being held for um, the pairs that assist with um, Friendship Bench? So the first question was my personal experience. Um, I'm sure I got that. Is it? It wants you to elaborate more on your personal experience that led to... Sure, all right. Um, I, I didn't talk about my TED talk, but I, in the TED talk that I gave, I talk a lot more about my personal experience and how all of that... So what I talked about today was really this, um, the, oper the cleanup operation, how it played a role, but there were also personal um, factors involved um, in my decision to actively try and focus on um, community-based uh, mental health uh, interventions. Um, and really, in essence, around about the same time after WIDA, a, um, a patient of mine uh, took her own life. Uh, Erica was her name. And the reason why Erica took her own life was because they essentially didn't have the bus fare to come and see me at the hospital. They lived like 200 kilometers away. And I think what, um, what touched me about Erica's story was the, the telephone conversation with her mother after she had taken her own life, you know, when the mother told me what had happened. And, you know, I, I immediately asked her why they hadn't come for review. And Erica's mother said, because we didn't have, you know, the $10 bus fare to come to you. So that affected me immensely, and, and you know, and together with all the other things that were happening, that's when I started to really think we need to have something in the community. You know, so one of the things that we focus on the Friendship Bench as well is you know, really averting suicides, and our data does show that spending more time on the bench results in uh, a, a statistically significant decline in, um, in, in suicides. So that's, a, that's at a personal level. And, and also just working in a, in a psychiatric uh, hospital, um, it's, it's very much focused on medication. A lot of the conditions that present in these facilities can benefit from just structured talk therapy. You know, it's just that there are not enough people doing it. And so, the friendship bench is like one of the options that we're trying to provide and make, try and turn it into a low hanging fruit, essentially. Yeah. Jody and then Alan. Um, thank you very much. I'm a DFL in law student here. Um, two things resonated particularly with me from your speech. Firstly, recognizing the role that grandmothers are playing uh, in this intervention. And we, and an, in an African context, are accustomed to grandmothers being somewhat altruistic in the manner in which they offer their service. Uh, and secondly, the fact that this is a, a sort of a community, homegrown, indigenous uh, intervention. Um, and marrying the two, um, whether you've thought or are pursuing a commercialization of this uh, indigenous, and I use this term advisedly, product um, in order for you to reap uh, some form of financial benefit from this intellectual product um, and re recognizing the fact that now this uh, Zimbabwean uh, product has been exported to New York City. Uh, 
this okay a much more wealthy city and of course has given prominence to the product um, and that disparity exists notwithstanding the fact that there is an acknowledgement in the video as you can see of the origins of the product and sort of the relating to uh, the suggestion that was made to uh, transpose this to the United Kingdom context uh, giving it more of a uh, financial aspect commercial aspect and also allowing these grandmothers to ultimately derive a benefit? Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. And um, we have, in the last year, started looking into that. Um, you know, because our strength, you know, the, the core Friendship Bench team, is really the technical expertise that we possess in how to, to train people to deliver this model and the different stages that you need to go through in order for it to be done well and to ensure that there's fidelity. You know, if you're training thousands of people, how do you ensure that all of them are doing the right thing and the same thing? So that's, that's what we're trying to package. And uh, in the future, hopefully, when we are invited to train in uh, different places, we can, you know, charge for that. I mean, right now we're preparing to go to Liberia and, uh, and Rwanda, uh, and those governments will be paying. But when Friendship Bench was started, the, the objective was never to make, turn it into a commercial entity. Um, but now we see the need to at least support the activities that keep it going. You know, so yeah, we are thinking of that. Maybe if you have some ideas, you can share with me. Yeah. <laughs> Alan, have we got the... Sorry, and then, then we'll come to you next. Yeah, sorry. Hi, I'm Alan Stein. Thank you very much for the really excellent talk, Dixon. Um, quite understandably, the, your, the friendship bench is based on a one-to-one -one model, but when you're talking about younger children and smaller children and families where often a lot of difficulties begin, do you think there's potential to perhaps have to develop that? I realize there'd be more complexity about having more than one person seeing um, in the friendship bench, especially if you bring children uh, through with perhaps their parents, even their grandparents, their caregivers. Thank you. Um, thank you, Alan. Um, so I didn't talk about the groups, um, but what typically happens on the friendship bench and, um, is when people receive the one-on-one -on -one sessions on the bench, after the fourth session, they are invited to group support sessions, peer support sessions. And um, these are some of the most powerful groups, actually. Um, and I think they have contributed significantly to the, to the sustainability of Friendship Bench. And in these groups, people meet on a regular basis, on a weekly basis, in every community where you have a bench. And because they've all been empowered with this problem-solving skill, they are now collectively problem solving about their communities, about different issues that they are facing at community level. It could be issues related to a typhoid outbreak. It could be issues related to, um, um, you know, the shortage of water, you know, and they've become quite powerful. And they've, some of them have gone on to form, you know, income generating projects. So we are doing that, but not so much for young people. We are hoping that this youth friendship bench will come up with a, an alternative strategy for the young people. And one of the things that we're doing with the youth friendship bench is also looking at digital platforms. We are using digital platforms to empower these groups um, of young people where they can actually access services through, um, through an app, which is currently being tested uh, in, uh, in Kenya and uh, in India. Great, so this will be our last question. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, hi, so um, I'm Yamasi Bokini, and, and many thanks for your um, contributions. Forgive me if I missed answers to this question because I stepped out briefly, um, but I have two. So the first one is with regards to signposting. Um, so I'd imagine most of the cases that come about on the friendship bench are like depression and anxiety and things like that. But when it comes to like things like you know um, manic depression or psychosis, for example, is there like a pathway that ensures that they get to see psychiatrists as opposed to uh, sort of talking yeah. to therapies? Um, the second one was um, you know you mentioned the emic uh, perspective, and I was wondering as an African, 
whether or not you had any perceptions of how you thought it would work based on your knowledge and, and whether or not, um, you know, in reality, it, it was different. So if, if you were surprised by, by, by the way it worked um, from your you know, personal point of view. Thank you. Um, yeah, from my personal point of view, I was surprised because trained as a psychiatrist, what I was familiar with in, uh, in mental health was the ethic approach, you know, and so, but after my experience in, in, in WIDA, I, I realized that there was a need to, to almost have a bottom-up approach, you know, um, and, and I, obviously I, I didn't think it would have such a huge impact you know, to be quite honest, um, but um, it's it somehow worked. And you see, the, the, the interesting thing about the friendship bench is we did what we did and only started looking at why it worked later. You know, so it's not your traditional top bottom where you come up with a hypothesis, you know, it's hypothesis driven. With Friendship Bench, it was almost like, you know, an organic thing which just happened and then it's, then you start asking yourself questions and, you know, let's do a clinical trial, you know, we need to see how this works, you know, um, let's, let's, let's follow up a, a, a cohort of, of patients and the grandmothers. So we've got quite a lot of data, for instance, on, on just the grandmothers themselves, because one of our concerns was, um, you know, these, 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 these elderly women are going to be affected by doing all this work where they are seeing so many people with trauma and, and all sorts of things. But the surprising thing is uh, when we carried out a, a survey, in fact, it was a PhD topic for one of my colleagues where she looked at the grandmothers and compared these grandmothers with, with you know, um, similar grandmothers in the community who were not on the friendship bench, very low levels were found of common mental disorders, including PTSD. And so now we're looking into what it is, you know, obviously there's the whole concept of altruism, but they are also benefiting from it because the grandmothers are using the friendship bench approach in their immediate family as well. Um, and then your first question, which was about um, the severe cases and referral. Uh, again, I didn't mention this, but the Friendship Bench is actually based on an algorithm. There's an algorithm that we follow. People come to the bench, so anyone can be referred to the bench. When they get to the bench, they are screened. We have locally validated screening tools. And based on the cutoff score, and based on how they respond to the questions, the grandmothers will know this is PTSD, this is anxiety, this is depression, this is a psychosis. What do I do with the psychosis? Next level is here. So it's really a stepped care. But over the years, because the grandmothers have gained so much experience, they are actually able to handle cases that we were originally that we would originally refer. Like for instance, if someone is suicidal, that's a red flag. But we now have grandmothers who've been in Friendship Bench for like 10 years who are able to manage those cases, who are able to actually go to the clinic nurse and, and talk to the clinic nurse about the need for medication, the need for referral to the hospital, or actually take the person to, to, to the hospital. You know, and we've recently incorporated a very specific component that looks at PTSD. And again, all of these new additions are derived from the lessons that we are picking up from the grandmothers. You know, for instance, when we have the debriefings and the grandmothers are describing, you know, clients who they are taking care of, who have, you know, um, recurrent flashbacks uh, of traumatic uh, events, who have recurrent nightmares, phobic avoidances, and we begin to pick what, put one and one together and we're like, oh, this is PTSD. Let's package it. Let's find out what the grandmothers are doing. And then we package what they are doing, um, and that becomes the PTSD component. The same with people living with HIV. You know, um, you know I, was, I was totally shocked when the grandmother said to me, you know, wh what's this deal with obsessing about talking to people who are HIV positive about adherence to medication? You know, you should really be looking at the issues around their personal lives. And so we've started doing that. And what we did, again, this is data which is not yet published, but um, preliminary results show 
that that approach actually improves adherence. Uh, and we're using, um, you know, we are, we are using viral load, viral load to, to actually establish that. And so all these new things that we're adding are really coming out of the experience that we're seeing from the grandmother, the feedback that we're getting. Yeah. Great. Well, I can see there are a couple of other questions still. We're going to break now for coffee, and hopefully those people will grab Dixon during the yeah. coffee break, and I'm sure many other people will too. So Dixon, once again, I just want to thank you so much for Thanks. such an inspiring figure. Thank you.